Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Georgia Medicaid Fair Provider Appeals Process and Common Denials presentation. My name is Kendall Telfair. I am the provider rep for Territory 9, which is Southeast Georgia. First, I would like to go over a housekeeping item. In order to access this presentation, please visit www.mmis.georgia, spelled out, .gov. You do not need to be logged in on the secure side. In order to access this presentation, you can go to provider information tab and in the subcategory, you'll find provider notices and then you will select the fall Medicaid Fair 2022 provider appeals process presentation. The Georgia Department of Community Health Mission, we provide Georgians with access to affordable quality health care through effective planning, purchasing, and oversight. We are dedicated to a healthy Georgia. On today's agenda, we will discuss common prior authorizations and pre-certification denials, common miscellaneous denials, the difference between a DMA 520 and DMA 528, which is very important to know, how to contact Gainwell Technologies, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers at the end. The first common PA and pre-cert denial is edit 3001. This edit is the PA is not on file. So this edit is triggered when the PA number entered on the claim is invalid or it simply hasn't crossed over into the gamut system yet. In order to correct this, you need to verify the PA number that you entered on the claim. Make sure you double check it, triple check it. I've always encouraged my providers to check the number because it may be just off a digit and that happens very often. So make sure that you verify the PA number, correct it, then resubmit the claim on the GAMIS web portal. Now, let's just say if the PA is valid and you are still receiving a denial, please reach out to your provider rep as soon as possible by submitting a contact us ticket on the GAMIS website, and I will explain how to do that later in the presentation. Next edit is 3003. The PA procedure code requires a PA or pre-certification. So this is triggered when the claim is, um, you submitted a claim with a code that requires a prior authorization or pre-certifications based on the contract billing rule. I always encourage my providers to do a procedure code search prior to rendering services to a member. That way you can understand what is required, the contract billing rules, it's very important. In order to correct this, you will need to review the billing rules in GAMIS, the contract billing rules that I was just speaking about, or you can review the manual part two, and then you will enter the correct PA number on the claim during the resubmission. Now let's discuss some common miscellaneous denials. The first one that I would like to discuss is edit 2276, the emergency medical assistance attachment. This is triggered when the member's benefit plan is emergency medical assistance eligibility. In order to correct this edit, you will need to make sure that you attach medical documentations to show urgent medical care provided in the absence of immediate medical attention. As you can see here, um, these are some reasonably likely um, to result in at least one of the following, placing the individual health in serious jeopardy, serious impairment to bodily functions, or serious dysfunction of any bodily organs or part. And it also includes emergency labor and delivery services. Now, there are two services that are non-covered, which is the prenatal and the postpartum care. The next miscellaneous denial is sterilization. This is edit 3402, sterilization form required. So this happens, this edit happens when the detail level for the CMS 1500 claims and the header level for UB04 claims 
when the DMA form is not attached for review on the claim. You have to make sure that you attach the DMA 69 sterilization form on the claim. Now let's just say if you disagree with the medical review portal, I mean medical review decision, then please submit a DMA 52A inquiry or appeal. And this one, this edit 3402 requires a DMA 5520A because it is a medical edit and it needs to be medically reviewed. The DMA 69 form, it informs consent for voluntary sterilization. Now, you have to keep in mind and always remember that the DMA 69 form must be completed in its entirety on the very first submission. You are not allowed to submit a corrected DMA 69 form. So make sure you do it right the first time and complete the form in its entirety. And you can find the guidelines on the GAMIS Well Portal under the Provider Information tab and in the subcategory you'll see Provider Manuals. Please review your manuals, it's very important. Another common um, denial is the common service limit denials, edit 6259. This is the calendar year office visits is seated. This is triggered when the member has exceeded more than 10 office visits within one year. In order to correct this, you need to make sure that you verify the data, okay, and that you captured it correctly, and just go back in there and make any changes that needs to be done. And you can verify under the member's eligibility on the GAMIS Well Portal service limits panel prior to rendering services to the member in order to avoid this denial. So you can check to see how many office visits a member has had for that year. DMA 520 initial general claim denial review. This now we're gonna talk about how to appeal denied claims. Here is a list of the commonly reviewed edits that you will file a DMA 524. This is the non-medical edits, okay? So just to name a few, the 4801 billing rule not found for bill procedure, or the one that we see very often is the 545 or 512, which is the timely filing. You can submit a DMA 520 for those edits. Now let's discuss the DMA 520 claim inquiry guidelines. Please keep in mind that you can only submit one DMA 520 form electronically per inquiry. And make sure that you complete all the data fields on the e-form on the GAMIS website. Now for new inquiries, you will receive a contact tracking number, better known as a CTN, Please keep up with your CTN and your claim ICN. This will help you keep track of your appeal requests. For previously submitted inquiries, the, st the status will be provided along with the option to electronically upload supporting documentation. Please include all supporting documentations for your appeal via the CTN. And these documentations includes the EOB, or um, claim submission history if applicable. Now let's say if you see your CTN status is showing as closed, you will not be able to upload any supporting documentations at that time. Once it closed, no supporting documentations can be submitted. And please note that DMA 520 appeal requests must be requested within 30 days of the denial, the claims denial or adverse action. So you have 30 days from when the claim denies to submit a DMA 520. Here is a snippet of uh, a claim if it's not eligible for an appeal. As you can see here where it says DMA 520 inquiry, it is grayed out. That means that you have most likely past the time limit <laughs> of the 30 days and is no longer eligible for an appeal. This is an example of the total opposite. This means that you are eligible for an appeal if you see that it's in blue, okay? 
That means you can submit the DMA 520. Here is an example of a DMA 520 email notification. You do not have to reply or need to reply to this email notification. It is just letting you know that we received your DMA 520 that you submitted. And here is an example of the response letter that you will receive for a DMA 520. It just lets you know um, your, as the provider, your inquiry and Gainwell's response to your 520. Now I'll turn it over to Alliant Health Solutions. Good morning. Hi, I'm Javelin Ariel with Alliant Health Solutions, and I will be going over the medical claims review common denials. Please refer to the banner message posted on May 18th, 2018 regarding policy clarifications on submitting the DMA 520A medical appeal. The banner message includes what supporting documentation is needed for different suspended claim review types. Please follow the press processes outlined by DCH for suspended claims Supporting documentation should be attached to the suspended claim in the GAMMA's claim system. Please use the appropriate attachment indicator, OZNN, B4 should be used for hospice. If documentation is not attached to the claim, then the claim might deny and you will need to resubmit the claim with supporting medical documentation. For inquiries and appeals, the DMA 520A is to be submitted for medical review. Appeals are, appealed, appeals are to be submitted on a denied claim or denied line item. Please do not submit an appeal on a suspended claim. Please include a valid ICN number that you are appealing. You have 30 days from the RA date to submit the appeal. Supporting documentation is to be attached to the appeal when it is submitted. If documentation is not attached, the system will auto deny the appeal. For administrative reviews, the Q number, which is your appeal number, is to be included with the request. Supporting documentation is to be attached at the time of the request. You have 30 days from the denial letter to request an administrative review. So edit 3359 is modifiers. A modifier provides the means to report or indicate that a service or procedure that has been provided has been altered by some specific circumstance but not changed in the definition or code. Alliant reviews modifiers 22, 24, 26, 52, 54, 55, 58, 62, and 78. For the method of correction, attach the medical documentation to support the modifier build in GAMAS. If you would disagree with the medical review decision in GAMAS, then please submit a DMA 520A inquiry appeal. For the 22 modifier, documentation must support the substantial additional work and the reason for the additional work. Increased intensity, time, technical difficulty of the procedure, the severity of the patient's condition, physical and mental effort required. For the 24 modifier, that is for an E&M visit during the post-op period that is unrelated to the original procedure. For the 26 modifier, it's for the physician or other qualified health professional component that is reported separately. The 52 modifier is for a service or procedure that is partially reduced or eliminated at the discretion of the physician or other qualified healthcare professional. For the 54 modifier, it is used when one physician or another qualified healthcare professional performs a surgical procedure. For the 55, is when one physician or another qualified healthcare professional performs the post-operative management and another performs the surgical procedure. The 58 is for a procedure or service during the post-operative period 
that was planned or anticipated, staged, more extensive than the original procedure, or for therapy following a surgical procedure. For the 62 modifier is when two surgeons work together as a primary surgeon performing distinct parts of a procedure. Each surgeon should report the co-surgery once during the same procedure, once using the same exact same procedure code. For the 78 modifier, another procedure was performed during the post-operative period of the initial procedure, unplanned procedure following the initial procedure. Okay, so common denial reasons. There we go. For the 22 modifier, documentation does not support the substantial additional work or indicate what was above and beyond the standard procedure. For the 24 modifier, there must be a paid 10 or 90 day global period by the same rendering provider or by other qualified healthcare professionals before attaching the 24 modifier to a visit code. For the 58 modifier, the submitted documentation does not indicate that the procedure performed was a planned procedure, nor does it indicate that this procedure was more extensive than the original procedure. Okay, sorry. There you go. All right, so the 58 modifier is for a stage procedure performed during the postoperative period. No previous surgeries could be located in the claims history. For the 62 modifier, the procedure code build must be the same as a co-surgeon. One surgeon build for the procedure without the 62 modifier. The co-surgeons must both bill the same procedure code with the 62 modifier in order to be paid. And the providers must be of different specialties. And for the 78 modifier, there must be a paid surgical procedure in the claims history before attaching the 78 modifier within the 10 or 90 day global period. So edit 4257 is for modifier restriction for procedure billing rule. Um, this edit is set to auto deny in GAMIS. Um, the edit cannot be overridden by the claim system and will not be paid. And so any appeals submitted on this will be denied because the edit cannot be overridden. So edit 3321 is for observations greater than 24 hours. Um, this edit post when the claim build has greater than 24 total units build for revenue code 762. Your method of correction is to attach your supporting medical documentation to the claim in GAMIS. If you disagree with the medical review decision in GAMIS, then submit your DMA 520A appeal. So common denials for this edit are um, no observation order was submitted. So an outpatient observation always begins and ends with a physician order. So that's very important to submit. Um, also, submit the, submit the observation order, admission note, discharge summary, HMP, op notes, physician notes, and nurse's notes to support the observation build greater than 24 hours. So that's commonly used when no documentation is attached. All right, another is the stay met inpatient interqual criteria. And that means that the claim will be denied because they did not meet observation status. So an approved statement that you will commonly see is approved the medical review determination determined that observation beyond 24 hours did not meet interqual inpatient criteria. So if a member did not meet inpatient criteria, they are appropriate for observation status. All right, so this is just part from DCH policy. 
observation, outpatient observation begins and ends with a physician's order. Hospitals should not substitute outpatient observation services for medically appropriate inpatient admissions. Next is edit 5824, add-on not allowed without primary procedure code. This edit is triggered when the primary procedure code is not in a paid status. So your method of correction is to submit a DMA 520A appeal and attach the supporting medical documentation. So your common denial reasons include the CPT code is an add-on code and per CP Per CPT guidelines, add-on codes are always performed in addition to the primary procedure and must never be reported as a standalone code. So we will look to make sure you have a paid primary procedure code. Another denial reason is the qualifying primary procedure code was not billed on the claim for the same date of service for the same member by the same provider. And the qualifying primary procedure code on the claim for the same date of service is not found to be paid or in a to be paid status. So edits 5642, 3402, and 3432 is for your sterilizations, which is your DMA 69 form. Uh, the only acceptable form for the sterilization procedure is the DMA 69 form. Any other forms submitted are not acceptable by DCAH. This edit is triggered when there is a sterilization procedure or diagnosis code on the claim. So your method of correction is to submit and attach the DMA 569 form to the claim in GAMIS. If you disagree with the medical review decision, then submit the DMA 528 appeal. So common denial reasons include the only consent form acceptable to the division is the informed consent for voluntary sterilization, the DMA 69. No other form can be used. So if you use the hospital's sterilization consent form, that's not acceptable according to DCH policy. There are blank lines on the consent to sterilize the recipient of the DMA 69 form. The entire physician statement section of the DMA 69 form is blank. The physician signed and dated the DMA 69 form before the date of the sterilization, less than 30 days from the consent date and the date of the service on the DMA 69 form. All right, claims for payment submitted without the required documentation or with incomplete and or inaccurate documentation will be denied, and this is located in DCH policy. The division does not accept documentation meant to satisfy informed consent requirements that has been completed or altered after the service was performed. An individual may consent to be sterilized at the time of a premature delivery if the premature delivery occurs before 37 weeks of gestation per ACOG guidelines or an emergency abdominal surgery is performed in at least 72 hours have passed since the informed consent has been given. In the case of a premature delivery, the informed consent must have been given at least 30 days before the expected date of delivery. The expected date of delivery must be provided on the DMA 69 form and also less than 72 hours have occurred between the when, when the member signed the form and when the sterilization procedure was performed. DCH indicates that there has, been, has to be 72 hours between when the member signed the form and when the sterilization procedure was performed. All right, so we have edits 30, 3401 and 3433 which is the hysterectomy, which is your DMA-276 form. Uh, the only acceptable form for the hysterectomy procedure is the DMA-276 form. All other forms are not acceptable. So once again, hospital consent form is not acceptable. Uh, this edit is triggered when there is a hysterectomy procedure code or diagnosis code on the claim. Method of correction is to attach that DMA-276 form to the claim in GAMIS. If you disagree with the medical review decision, 
then submit a DMA 520A appeal. And common denial reasons include the physician's signature or date is not on the DMA 69 form. Uh, the division does not accept documentation meant to satisfy informed consent requirements, which has been completed or altered after the service was performed. And the form must be signed either before or after the hysterectomy and, follow, and follows and must be attached to the claim form submitted to the division for payment. As such, claims for payment submitted without the required documentation or incomplete or inaccurate documentation will be denied. So edits 2276 and 2277 is for emergency medical assistance, EMA. Uh, this edit is triggered when the member's eligibility status is illegal and documentation is attached. If no documentation is attached, the claim, claim system will auto-deny your claim request. And at that point, you'll need to resubmit the claim and attach the supporting medical documentation for review. So method of correction is to attach the required documentation per the DCH Part 1 Policy, ma policy Manual, Section 208.1. If you disagree with the medical review decision, then submit your DMA 520A. So common denial reasons for EMA is the documentation does not indicate that an emergent medical condition has occurred. Though the services provided was medically necessary, it does not meet the federal definition of an emergency medical condition. The member did not present with the sudden onset of a health condition with acute symptoms as required by the federal regulations for an emergency medical condition. All right, so you've billed for maintenance hemodialysis for chronic renal failure. Though the procedure provided is medically necessary, it does not meet the federal definition of an emergency medical condition. And prenatal and postpartum care are non-covered for EMA. Only the delivery is covered as long as it's not elective. And a sterilization is an elective procedure and is non-covered for EMA. Claims must include documentation that supports the emergency nature of the services provided. Records should be submitted in distinct sections and in chronological order from the beginning of the admission to the discharge. Only the following should be submitted to Alliant for a review. You have your HMP, your admin note, your discharge summary, your op report, physician progress notes, and for deliveries or C-section claims only, you can submit your LND or C-section report only. And for anesthesia claims only, you're able to only submit the anesthesia report and your LND or C-section notes. So also be aware if records are received out of order, um, you can have your associated claim denied. Claims submitted for any labor inductions or C-sections on or before 39 weeks gestation that are not properly documented as medically necessary will be denied. Okay, so edit 22652, 2653, and 2032 are your non-hospice edits, and that is your DMA 521 form. This edit is triggered when the build dates of service span a hospice attachment indicate, attachment plan. A method of correction is to submit your DMA 521 non-hospice form with the claim in GAMIS. With hospice, you have to use the B4 attachment indicator for it to suspend to us. Otherwise, it will not suspend for medical review. If you disagree with the medical review decision, then you can submit an appeal. So common denial reasons is the DMA 521 form is incomplete. Line 13 is blank and your hospice diagnosis is missing. Line 12 is blank. Your non-hospice diagnosis is missing. And also for services, billed are related to the hospice diagnosis. 
the division will not reimburse for non-hospice provider for non-hospice related services without the hospice referral form. The hospice agency is responsible for all services related to the terminal illness and any condition related to the terminal illness including inpatient care and outpatient services. If care services are required by the hospice patient that are unrelated to the hospice diagnosis, the provider of that care and service must first contact the hospice agency to obtain the hospice diagnosis before the, of the patient before rendering care and service. The non-hospice service provider must obtain the hospice diagnosis to insert on the DMA 521 form prior to rendering service and care. Uh, failure to do so may result in your denial of your claim. So edit 592A is your NCCI edit, and that is your National Correct Coding Initiative. For this, you will need to submit a DMA 520A appeal and attach your supporting medical documentation. So common denial reasons for this is the CPT code is considered to be incidental, which is included as part of the other procedure code per NCCI, therefore separate reimbursement cannot be made. And so that has been based upon review of the supporting medical documentation that the documentation does not indicate a distinct procedure and CPT code is to be mutually exclusive per the other um, CPT code per NCCI and therefore separate reimbursement cannot be made. So edit 1306 is for out of state. This edit is triggered when the provider's location is listed as out of state and when you submit the claim you need to attach the documentation and GAMAS. If you disagree with the medical review decision, then submit the appeal. So common denial reasons for out of state is um, no documentation was attached to the claim. So with that, we need documentation to support that emergency visit. So you need your admit note, HMP, discharge summary, and op notes. Another denial reason is there's no PA letter or single case agreement attached to the claim. Also, a valid PA number is not on the claim. Out-of-state claims submitted for reimbursement must have either a valid PA number on the claim and a copy of the prior authorization letter or supporting medical documentation to justify if the services provided were an emergency or life-endangering situation. An out-of-state provider cannot obtain a prior authorization request. Only your referring in-state provider can obtain the PA. And so per DCH policy, section 909G, members should be transferred to another in-state Georgia facility before transferring the member to an out-of-state emergent care. The medical record should document why the member was not transferred to another Georgia facility. All right, so DCH's hospital policy manual, section 909F, Routine health care or elective surgery provided by an out-of-state provider is not covered unless prior authorization is obtained. The referring in-state provider is required to obtain a prior authorization um, for approval by documenting and writing the medical necessity, obtaining the out-of-state services, and providing the name and address of the out-of-state medical provider. And once again, the out-of-state provider cannot request a PA. All right, some more DCH policy. Routine health care or elective surgery provided by an out-of-state provider is not covered unless a PA is obtained. Members should be transferred to another in-state Georgia facility before transferring the member to an out-of-state for emergency care, the medical record should document why the member was not transferred to another Georgia facility. The referring in-state provider is required to request prior approval by documenting and writing the medical necessity of obtaining the out-of-state services and providing the name and address of the out-of-state medical provider. And once again, the out-of-state provider cannot obtain a PA request. <laughs> 
So now we have ER flat rates. Um, this edit causes the claim to pay the ER flat rate, which is either $60 for urban hospitals or out-of-state counties, or $70 for rural hospitals. So if you get paid that, you would need and disagree and are requesting additional reimbursement. You need to submit the DMA 520A appeal and attach your supporting medical documentation. So common denial reasons include um, DCH Part T Policies and Procedure Management for Hospital Services, Section 906, the service and procedure bill is non-emergent. And so for your DCH policies, emergency medical services are defined as those that are medically necessary as the result of a sudden onset of a medical condition manifesting itself by acute symptoms of such severity that the absence of immediate medical attention could reasonably be expected to result in a serious dysfunction of any bodily part or death to the individual. Emergency rooms visits that can not be documented as a true medical emergency or potential medical emergency will be reimbursed at that all-inclusive flat rate fee of $60 for urban hospitals in out-of-state counties and $70 for rural hospitals. The rate for this um, in, for all in-state and out-of-state is, um, it includes all ancillary services rendered as well as fee for use of the emergency room. And this shows your appeal timeframes. From a denied claim, you have 30 days to request an appeal. From a denied appeal, you have 30 days to request an administrative review. And from a denied administrative review, you have 15 days to request an ALJ hearing. And next up is the prior authorization common denials. Good morning. So it's funny because many people think that I am Javelin and that Javelin is me. Um, I'm Lee Hamilton. I'm the deputy director of the Prior Auth Department at Alliance. So whenever, whenever, can you hear me better? Whenever you guys call the 1-800 number and get through that long recording and you want to talk about one of your 29 review types, um, that comes to my department. So um, often what Javelin and I do overlap and that's why sometimes it may go to her but really it's a PA issue and vice versa so they definitely overlap all right so we understand that there are many variables here um, it's not just that the clinical that you've sent is incomplete I mean with COVID there was a huge COVID shuffle you have a lot of new employees you have um, people that don't have a lot of medical experience maybe submitting your PAs um, you have people that uh, are new to the organization haven't been trained properly we, we understand all that and we try to help as much as we can with guiding you guys without telling you um, what you need to submit specifically because that's what your provider needs to do we don't we don't have the the uh, medical uh, opinion to be able to do that so um, but there's some general things that we are seeing there are some uh, kind of trends I would say probably um, DME uh, PA submissions radiology and probably procedures like your outpatient inpatient surgeries those are the ones that I'm seeing with particular pieces of clinical information being missing the most commonly DME is tricky are there any DME providers in here hey where are you from okay so uh, with DME it's really really tricky because you have a million different supplies and a million different pieces of equipment and they all require different pieces of documentation and it's hard to keep up with that we get that so we try to be as specific as possible when we do issue a denial if it is for some missing information if you have any questions specifically after you're welcome to to ask and I'll help you um, so really the most general thing is just clinical information um, sometimes providers just want to get that 
PA and, and timely, and we understand that too. Um, but we want to make sure, as the policy manual states, that you do submit the appropriate entirely uh, clinical picture so that we can make a determination on your case. Um, so sometimes we'll have like pertinent labs that aren't um, on the, in the clinical attachment, um, abnormal findings. Uh, what did the patient even come in for? Um, especially with radiology, we'll get the, um, if it's an emergency admission, we'll get the results of the scan, but we don't get why they even came in in the first place. Um, sometimes you can tell by the results of the scan if you have a pretty good established medical knowledge that, yeah, this patient really did need a scan. Um, but we really need to know why they came in. Um, we also have a lot of frequent flyers that come in the ER. It's not the facility's fault. They're trying to render the best care that they can. Um, and we understand that there are members that jump facilities, and, and maybe that's just because of the location they're in. Um, maybe they don't know where to go, um, and that's no fault of the facility as, as well. So we need to get the whole clinical picture. Um, we want to see any previous procedures or surgeries that have been done, treatment plan, and I would say conservative treatments is a huge thing because just like when you um, maybe start with a medication, uh, injectable medication, those are super, super duper expensive. So many of these have certain steps that the patient has had to exhaust before they get to the next level of treatment. Um, many times that's not noted in the chart, and so we need to know what did he, she try, and what didn't work, or maybe they're allergic or um, whatever. So um, I just listed some conservative treatments here, so make sure that you guys add those um, for any of your um, inpatient or outpatient procedures, uh, radiology, um, for that one. And we do 29 different review types. So if, if one of the review types is not something that I've mentioned and you need help with it, please come and talk to me. All right, so um, many of you have probably gotten a nurse denial. A nurse denial is um, basically there's something missing. Like, I can't approve a hip replacement if you don't give me an x-ray. I have to have that. Um, the nurse would just deny it and say I'm missing X, Y, and Z. Nurses cannot, on my team, deny for medical necessity. So they're not saying that the patient doesn't need it. They're just saying they can't justify it with what you've given them. Um, no clinical was submitted at all. We see that sometimes. Um, incorrect clinical submitted, so um, we get the wrong patient, wrong body part, so always check that when you're uploading your attachments. Um, Three-day readmit, so the patient came in um, with sepsis, they were inpatient, they were discharged home stable, uh, they went home, took their antibiotics, they came back two days later, high heart rate, still not feeling well. Um, many times two PAs will get submitted when really we just need to combine that one stay or they had maybe a radiology procedure um, and the, they end up in the facility for an inpatient stay. We would want to combine those so that they're one data service, it's all covered on that, under that DRG. Um, so our nurses are looking for that. We do have some automation built in our system to kind of flag those things as a heads up to us, like, hey, this might be related, you might want to look at that PA that was already put in. And we also understand that there oftentimes are two departments working on this, so maybe you were doing your due diligence to put in your radiology PA and you didn't know that the patient ended up going inpatient. Uh, we understand, so we'll just deny that second one, give you instructions to combine with the first one um, and upgrade from outpatient to inpatient um, under the hospital pre-certification review type. Um, let's see, any sort of policy violation? So um, I just put as an example is requesting to, get to downgrade from inpatient to outpatient. This is tricky because if the inpatient stay um, gets denied for medical necessity, providers will try to just take apart the pieces of the admission um, and put it in for uh, outpatient and we actually need the order to show that the patient was downgraded from inpatient to outpatient. Policy violation, I think of you and DME, um, many times there are specific ages that you have to be to qualify for a certain piece of equipment or supplies. Um, always check that. 
Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, Step therapy would be another policy violation if it specifically says on uh, the injectable med list that you have to have tried this before this. Um, the nurse may grant a denial and just say, can you give me some more information about what you guys have already tried? Um, code submitted under the wrong review type. This happens a lot. Um, office visits will be submitted under a hospital pre-certification. It has its own review type. So just make sure that you are um, that your provider ID is assigned to the correct review type um, and that whenever you go in GAMIS, you can actually submit it where it's appropriate. Um, incorrect codes submitted related uh, to the clinical. So this happens a lot too. Patient, um, it's usually just a coding error. So the patient comes in, they need a total knee. Um, the coding says total shoulder. And so we might issue a denial and say, can you just clarify what's actually being replaced here? Um, and give us the clinical. And sometimes they actually do need both, but they're doing them on different days and they just put the wrong clinical. All right, technical denials. So um, again, some of the nurse denials and technical denials can kind of overlap, um, but our technical denials, a lot of these are built in the system. So you'll get an automatic denial that says like, this does not meet whatever the policy may be. So, um, for hospital emergency admissions. You have 30 days, if there's no retro eligibility or anything like that, you have 30 days to submit the case. Um, let's say the provider submits the case on day 31. It will kick the request out. It will issue a tech denial and then you would have to reconsider and say, oh, I accidentally transcribed that date wrong. It really, they really came in on this day. Um, just explain thoroughly. Whenever you submit your reconsideration for review, um, that's what you would wanna explain to us. Elective procedures must be request, requested prior to the date of surgery. So if you did a procedure um, and it truly was something that was not an emergency, uh, we would either catch that on the clinical review or by the dates submitted. Um, we just talked about that one. Members part of a CMO, it is so hard to keep up with eligibility. Um, many times they bounce between. So if you get that and you're like, no, that's not right, um, just submit any uh, screenshot of GAMIS where it shows that the patient actually does have fee-for-service Medicaid. That is all that we are pre-certing on this team um, and make sure that you um, put the dates of eligibility for what they, where they exist for the date of service. Um, does not meet policy guidelines, we talked about that member has already exhausted max allowable for the time period. So for example, you can't have three wheelchairs in two days. Like you can't, <laughs> nobody needs three wheelchairs. They could, um, there, there could be some strange reason, but we would need to know more information about that. Um, so just making sure that you know your policy rules. Um, the, all of the policy manuals are located on GAMIS um, and we are also here to help navigate so you guys can find those. Um, we talked about radiology being one of our common uh, review types that get, I looked at the percent of denials um, and that's kind of how I came up with these. So uh, missing information, only the imaging results were received. Again, many of us can tell by the imaging results if they really needed to be there, but really we need to know the whole clinical picture because in subsequent submissions, then again, it gives the whole clinical picture. Um, duplicates from the same provider, this happens all the time. Um, many times Sally puts one in, uh, a PA, and she goes on vacation, Sandy comes in, she didn't know Sally did it, that sort of thing. Um, we have some stops in the system so that it will deny um, or flag it as a subsequent duplicate um, for, the for the reviewer. Uh, we talked about the conservative treatments and missing documentation for radiology for like the um, MRIs, CTs. Um, cardiac radiology, I find, is a, a, they're pretty common to get denials of like, okay, what is the cardiac history of this patient? Like, is this their first echo that they're ever getting or have they had a murmur since birth and they've had some issues along the way? Um, incorrect coding. So these are tricky. OB ultrasounds um, 
if you've ever had to submit one of these, there's many OB ultrasound codes, and it all depends on the gestation of the baby, what's going on with the mom. You can only have this many in, in this amount of time. Um, so again, just making sure that you're getting with your provider and getting the correct code. Um, and then like a lot of times they'll leave off the HCG level. So I got with the radiology reviewers, there's probably about mm, six of them, seven of them. Um, and I asked them like, what are you seeing? I know what I see, but what are you guys seeing? And we kind of agreed on these common things. So if it's anything about a pregnant patient, just give us the HCG, that's helpful. And then, anybody here submit injectable meds for office or facility? There may be somebody online that is. Uh, no clinical documentation attached to the PA. So we know that there are data boxes in GAMIS that you can type into, and that's totally fine if you wanna put your clinical in there. Some review types do require an attachment. Uh, injectable medications, I do not believe they are one of them. So if you type the clinical in entirety, you don't have to submit an attachment. DME, you have to have an attachment on every single PA. Um, multiple duplications for the same provider. Again, that's just that Sandy Sally um, example. So we do not do retro uh, with, or we do retro eligibility only with untimely submissions. And it's really important um, with our retro eligibility, we go back to the criteria in GAMIS for that year. So if you are submitting medications and it's a retro case, we're gonna use the medication criteria that was valid during that data service because we expect that that's what you followed um, when you treated the patient. Um, discrepancy with the drug requested in the clinical versus the drug on the PA, those codes are, again, it's just a coding error a lot of times. Um, it could be just a number off and we understand that that happens um, we will deny it, just ask you to um, confirm if this is actually the medication you're gonna be given. And we have to strictly meet the DCH um, PADL, which is that physician drug list criteria. Make sure if you are online and you are one of these providers that you are checking that drug criteria quarterly because it does change. Um, even with one drug, you can have it change every other quarter because we're keeping up with FDA guidelines, right? So those change. Sometimes they get relaxed, sometimes they get a little stricter. Um, we also know that um, the uh, drug rebates have a lot to do with that as well. And then hospital outpatient therapy providers, are there any in the room for facilities? Okay, so Hospital outpatient therapy for Medicaid is only provide for acute injury, illness, um, so it would follow a stroke, um, a current motor vehicle accident, like something that just happened probably within the last six months. Um, so you can't put in uh, hospital outpatient therapy for somebody that's had back pain for 20 years. Medicaid does not cover that. Um, it can also get tricky because maybe they did have a back injury, but it's kind of an acute on chronic um, condition. Please just make sure that you explain that to us. Um, it could be something, maybe you did have a motor, motor vehicle accident, and so now you have an even more severe injury at the area that was already previously injured. Um, making sure that we put the, um, that we receive the exact date of the onset of the injury. Again, that's the hardest part about these is determining if it really was acute or if it was something that happened a while back. Um, making sure that you put the current plan of care um, that includes the rehab potential, frequency, duration, whatever the patient's gonna need. How long do they think this th therapy is gonna need, be needed for this patient? And this is for pediatrics and for adults, so all ages. Um, we have started using the specific modifiers because it's really hard when a PA is submitted to know, okay, what specialty are they asking for? There are overlapping codes. So for um, occupational therapy and for physical therapy, some of those treatment codes overlap. So it helps the reviewer to know what are you requesting. Because somebody that did have a stroke, they may need all three of those, and that's appropriate but we wanna make sure that the units are being distributed where they're actually going to be treated. 
And then the PAs for HOTS are separated into evaluation and treatment. So you would need an evaluation PA for the initial evaluation or equipment evaluation. And then you would also need the treatment PA for any of those modalities that are gonna be done for that patient. Um, provider has answered no to, is this acute? So then it's automatically probably gonna issue some sort of denial. You'll have to write back and explain why maybe you click the wrong button or explain further. Um, so this one is talking, this point um, is talking about the provider requesting CPT codes for more than one discipline. So we ask that each discipline is submitted separately because again, we wanna make sure that the units are being distributed where they need to go. Um, there's different departments um, submitting these many times too. Um, so it's just helpful for the reviewers as well as for the provider um, so that care is not uh, prolonged for this patient. And then uh, let's see, there is a PA template. So when you put in um, a HOTS PA, it, there are questions. I think there's like eight questions. So it, it will walk you through exactly what you need to have. Um, for a HOTS PA, you have to have an attachment um, because you need, we need the plan of care. The system will deny it. And just remember on reconsiderations, you have 30 days to submit um, for us to appeal your case for us to review. And then we talked about durable medical equipment. So um, making sure we have to make sure all of the dates um, line up with the paperwork that's submitted. Some of these pieces of equipment and supplies require DCH specific CMNs and some don't. So you have to make sure you look at the policy manual to see which CMN you need to attach. Um, sometimes the invoice is not thorough. It doesn't have the um, information that we need, whether it's the calculation of price or um, the codes that match what's on the CMN or the PA that's submitted. Uh, manufacturer invoice, wrong modifier is used. That's also tricky with DME because there are many different modifiers that are required for different CPT codes. Make sure you know those. Um, code doesn't meet the age requirement policy. Make sure you're submitting it on the correct age range. Um, letter of medical necessity is required for some supplies and equipment, so make sure you have that included from your provider. Make sure that it is current within the thir last 30 days of submission. Um, clinical is missing, so like when we we're reviewing um, enteral nutrition, we've gotta have the date, uh, the height and weight to make sure that we do the appropriate calculation to distribute the number of units that is appropriate for that uh, CPT code for that patient. Um, enteral feeds, so I used to do some of these just because I wanted to know like what was so tricky about these PAs. Um, enterals are a, they get a huge denial volume um, because simply they're just missing information. We have to actually do a calculation um, on those PAs and we're looking back, there's a policy that states after 30 days you get this many units, after 60 days you get this many, after 90 days. So making sure that you submit that and, and tell us on um, the CMN, you know, is this his, is, has he exhausted 30 days and so this is your next trial period um, because those units change. Uh, patients grow, so they get more units. Um, change in provider form not submitted, so you can't just skip from DME provider to the next. Um, the patient actually has to be involved in that and that's why we make sure that we have that change in provider form. and all of those are in the DME policy manual. Um, and then I just have other review types. So these are a lot of the other review types that my team does. So if yours is listed on here and I haven't answered your question, you are welcome to come and find me after um, and I'll be happy to help you. I just wanted to ask one more thing. Any out of state submissions, is there any providers in here that submit out of state PAs? Okay, that's it. Thank you, Devlin and Lee, for that information. I'm sure that was very informative. So now you should understand how to correct a common claim denial as well as a common PA and pre-certification denial. You should also understand the guidelines for DMA 520 and DMA 528. Now, if you have any additional questions, please submit or contact us on the GAMIS website, which I will show you how to do in a few minutes, or you can contact the Provider Services Contact Center 
and choose option five if you have any questions regarding prior authorizations. Here is a map of the Georgia Field Territories. Here is a list of the provider relation field services representatives, which I'm sure that you all will meet today or have met already. Also, this is the way um, to contact your provider rep directly. You will log into the GAMIS website with username and password. Then you will select the tab that says contact information and in the subcategory, you'll see contact us. Also, you can use the option, the IVRS system as well as the Provider Services Contact Center. They're available 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., Monday through Friday. And um, the website is also available 24-7. You can always um, refer back to this, web this presentation um, on the GAMIS website under Provider Information and then the Provider Notices, okay? I hope you all enjoyed, and now we'll open it up for questions and answers.